Welcome guys to the African American Muslim Alliance of Tampa Bay, the Islamic Studies okay, class that we are having. Today we're going to have a class on the purification and prayer, uh, focusing on uh, the conditions of the prayer. Uh, and then after that, we're going to probably do about 15 minutes uh, to talking about the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, so we're going to begin uh, reading from the Jibril hadith. Uh, and this is very a very important hadith because it is a hadith that teaches us about our religion. So let's begin. Okay. Uh, Omar ibn al-Khattab reported, I was sitting with the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, one day when a man appeared with very white clothing and very and very black hair. There were no signs of travel on him and he did not recognize him. He sat down in front of the prophet. So let me stop right there. And uh, what my teacher said about this, because I did, I, I, uh, I was in a class with um, Sheikh Ibrahim Osi Effa where he covered the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. And this is the, the second hadith uh, in the, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. And so what he said is that what's important of this is that Omar ibn al-Khattab, who was a man of Medina, he didn't know who this man was, but he had no signs of travel on him because he had very white clothes and, and jet black hair. So usually at this time, if you travel in the desert, right? Your, your clothing is not going to be white. So that's what's being touched on here is that this man had no signs of travel on him and they didn't recognize him. And then it says he sat down in front of the prophet and rested his knees by his knees. So facing each other, sitting on your heels, knee to knee and placed his hand, the man placed his hands on the prophet Muhammad's thighs. So understand the intimacy of this meeting. The man said, O oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The prophet said, Islam is to, is to testify that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, to establish prayer and to give charity, to fast the month of Ramadan, and to perform pilgrimage to the house uh, if a way is possible. The man said, you have spoken truthfully. We were surprised that he asked him and said he was truthful. So what Omar ibn al-Khattab is saying here is that there was a there was awe that this man that we never knew before came, asked the Prophet Muhammad Islam a question, and when the Prophet Muhammad Islam answered, he said, "You've spoken the truth." Right. So Omar, they're they're kind of in astonishment. Who is this guy? Right. He he said, "Tell me about faith." The prophet said, faith is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and to believe in providence or predestination, the good of it and its evil. The man said, you have spoken truthfully. Tell me about excellence, ikhsan. The prophet said, excellence is to worship Allah as if you see him. For if you do not see him, he surely sees you. The man said, tell me about the hour. The prophet said, the one asked does not know more than the one asking. Okay. The man said, tell me about its signs. Okay. So when the prophet was asked this question, tell me about the hour. What he was saying is that the man that's asking about the, the, the hour doesn't know anything more than the one that's being questioned. So that the secrets of the hour are with Allah alone. So the man said, tell me about his signs. The prophet said, the slave girl gives birth to her mistress and, will, and you will see barefoot, naked, uh, and dependent shepherds compete in the construction of tall buildings. Then the man returned and I remained, which means the man left and Omar ibn al-Khattab remained with the prophet Muhammad so it says in the in the the, uh, the tafsir of this hadith, it says that there is a bit of time that passed 
uh, between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu asking Omar a question and the man leaving, okay? So the Prophet said to me, oh, Omar, do you know who he was? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. The Prophet said, verily, he was Jibril who came to teach you your religion, okay? And so again, as I mentioned in class previous, and inshallah, I'm going to continue to mention that this is what our religion is. The pillars of Islam, the articles of faith, how to gain excellence in your worship, okay? And understanding the signs of the, of the final hour, okay? And so this class that we're going to have today is talking about the pillars of Islam and uh, outside of your shahada, your prayer, understanding your prayer, since we know that the prayer is the first thing that we're going to be asked about on the day of judgment, we have to learn how to, uh, the conditions of our prayer, what validates our prayer, what invalidates our prayer, right? How, and, and all of the, the different points that what is wajib in our prayer, what is sunnah in our prayer, what is recommended in our prayer. If we make a mistake in our prayer, how do we fix it? Okay, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today, the opening conditions of the prayer. Okay, um, so we are reading from uh, an Akhtari, the Mutasar Akhtari, uh, which is, has been translated by Muhammad, Muhammad Rami and Sor al Indrisi, uh, and he has a, uh, a text, I'm sorry, not a text, but a YouTube lecture that goes along with it that we're going to uh, listen to as we read along in the text. Um, so as we begin, and we, we stop this class before uh, Ramadan, uh, probably about a month before Ramadan, and we went into the thick of fasting. So now we are back into the thick of, the, of purification and prayer. Um, and when we stopped, we started, we stopped at the point where we established the prayer times, knowing when one prayer begins and when one when the prayer goes out, okay, and the merging between the two. But now we are getting into the conditions of the prayer. Okay, so let us begin. Anyone who delays a prayer time and a prayer until the time has passed completely has done an enormous and grave wrong with the exception of someone who overslept or completely forgot. So if a person let the prayer totally go out, went from the Ada time to the Qada time, or even went from the Mukhtar time to the Daruri time without a valid excuse, then he has committed a grave and enormous wrong, a Kabira, unless he overslept because the pin was lifted from the person that's sleeping, or he just completely forgot. He was doing something, and he was totally heedless of, of, of the, of, he forgot about the prayer, and then the time went out. So um, uh, the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu has been excused for uh, forgetting forgetfulness or mistakes, unknowing uh, mistakes that they made. So if a person overslept, He's not, um, he definitely has to make up that prayer. This, and the same goes for the person who overlooked it, who forgot about it. And he should make sure in the future to, to try to um, have somebody wake him up or to put an alarm clock or do something to wake him up. And he should try to, to get in a state where he doesn't become heedless of the prayer. He becomes very conscious of the prayer. Now, if a person goes to sleep before the t pr uh, time comes in, like if he goes to sleep at night, and um, the time comes in, He's, he went to sleep before it came in, so it's not, um, there's no sin upon him for, for not waking up. So if a person's around him, the person should wake them up, but it's not, it's not wajib, it's not incumbent to wake up a person that's sleeping for them to pray. There is an opinion that it is wajib, so it would be best to go ahead and wake them up, but they sh you sh uh, one should know that it's not incumbent to wake a sleeping person up for prayer. It is, it is very recommended according to the dominant opinion, though. If a person... Okay, so what he's talking about at this point in time is delaying the prayer, okay? Um, that if, it, if the prayer time comes in 
and you just simply don't pray along that prayer time that you have uh, committed a grand sin, okay? Now, if you fall asleep and the prayer time comes in, let's say that you pray Maghrib, and it's actually considered makru, it's dislike to go to sleep in between Maghrib and Isha. But if you pray Maghrib and then you fall asleep and you haven't prayed Isha, and then you wake up in the morning time, right? That you haven't missed the prayer, right? Because you have a legitimate excuses of the falling asleep, okay? Um, what he's going to talk about is but if you, you're, you're getting tired and Isha has come in and then you fall asleep and you sleep and you miss the prayer time, then you have committed a grave sin. person went to sleep and that's if he went to sleep before the prayer time actually came in. Whereas if he went to sleep, at, once the prayer time has come in, he went to sleep and he knows that he's, he's going to sleep through the entire length of this prayer time, then when he goes back to sleep, it's uh, his missing the prayer is considered a sin. So if he went to sleep before the prayer time and missed the entire length of the prayer time, he's not taken into account for that. Although he has to make it up. Whereas if he went to sleep after the prayer time had already come in, then he is taken into account for that. He has to make it up and he has to do repentance for delaying the prayer. ولا تصل لنا نافلة بعد صلاة الصبح إلى ارتفاع الشمس وبعد صلاة العصر إلى صلاة المغرب وبعد طلوع الفجر إلا الورد لنائم عنه وعند جلوس إمام الجمعة على المنبر وبعد الجمعة حتى يخرج من المسجد نافلة is not prayed after the morning prayer until the sun rises so once a person prays the subh prayer the morning prayer he should not do any نافلة until the sun rises in the sky and the time of duha comes in so not only has the sun risen above the horizon but it's risen a um, up above the horizon and now it's lost the orange tint that it had when it first rose and it has this bright white which is the duha time so from the time a person finishes praying the subh prayer until the duha time it's makru to pray nafila except during the actual time of the uh, the rising of the sun which at that time it's haram to pray Likewise, no nafila prayer is, prayer is performed after Asr until the sun sets. So after a person prays Asr, then it is makru, dislike to pray nafila until a person prays Maghrib. So from that time until they pray Maghrib, except for the time that the sun is actually setting, in which case it is haram to pray uh, nafila. So in the times of rising the, the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, it's haram to pray nafila. But if a person is in a state where he's, uh, he delayed a, a, an obligatory prayer until that time, then he should go ahead and pray it. There's no um, sin in praying during the times of uh, setting and the rising of the sun. Nor should night prayers be for, performed after the dawn, un, uh, dawn light unless someone who normally prays them in the night misses them. So if a person has a wird, a normal prayer routine that they do every night, a, a certain set of uh, rak'ahs that they do for tahajjud, they should, they should be performing them before the dawn comes in. If the dawn has already come in, then it is makru to pray unless, it's the, um, um, unless a person normally does it and he overslept. So he can go ahead and pray his normal routine of prayers. And then he prays the fajr raghibah the two rak'ahs of sunnah before the, the, uh, the subah prayer, and then he prays the subah. No nafila. Now, the important, now when they're talking about the nafila, it's, it's, it's another word for the sunnah, right? Uh, or, or extra super, ter, super uh, prerogatory prayers. Uh, the, the sunnahs before, after, um, you know, tahajjit, uh, you know, so you're not praying during these times when the sun is rising or the sun is setting and there's a specific reason for that is to separate yourself from the the uh um, the sun worshipers okay so that people don't want don't confuse the muslims with the sun worshipers so of course you know we might not think that's a big deal today you know um but you know in the time of the prophet muhammad where you had Zoroastrianism and um, amongst the Persians, you know, which were fire worshipers, you know, and, and you had other sun worshipers coming out of Greece and, and Rome. Uh, it was very important that that separation was made between the two. Okay, so this is why 
it, it's makru, right? Uh, to pray during this time, it's highly disliked to pray during these times. And the time when the sun is rising, right? In between Fajr and Duha, it is considered haram to pray. Sunnah uh, prayers. Fila prayer is prayed at the Friday prayer once the Imam is seated upon the dais upon the mimbar until he actually leaves the masjid. So if a person enters into the Jum'ah prayer, uh, he can pray nafila unless the Imam has now left, um, uh, began walking towards the mimbar. Once he begins walking towards the mimbar, it becomes haram to begin any nafila. And once he's seated on the mimbar, uh, there's no nafila prayed until he completes the Jum'ah. So it's haram once the Imam begins walking towards the mimbar to begin a nafila prayer, even if a person is coming, has come into the masjid, um, he should not pray the greeting masjid, he, where, uh, um, and so he should just sit down, and that's according to the understanding of Imam Malik, whereas Imam Shafi'i considers that um, that e for for the, the tahiyyat al masjid during Jum'ah, even if the khatib is on the mimbar, that he goes ahead and prays. But for those following the Maliki madhab, they would not pray the tahiyyat al masjid um, when the imam once the imam is on the mimbar. And he would not pray until the Imam actually leaves the masjid. So from the time the man Imam walks towards the mimbar, it becomes haram to pray nafila. During the, the, the prayer and during the khutbah, it's haram to pray. After the Imam says assalamu alaikum from the prayer, it's disliked makru to pray nafila until he actually leaves the masjid. Okay, so this is talking about, and this is something that is specific to the Maliki school. It's a disagreement amongst the scholars and we have to understand that. But from the Maliki school, I'll give the reasoning why the Malikis believe this, is that understanding that the Juma prayer, right, has two rakat, but the khutbah before the, Jum before the, the Juma Salat is taking place of the two rakat that are missed during Duhr. Because, you know, during, on Fridays, you don't make Duhr. Right, you're making, you're going to Juma. So Duhr is four rakat, but Juma is two. So what, what Imam Malik in the Maliki school is saying is that during that time that you come in late, it's, it's haram for you to be praying and doing extra movements because that's considered a part of the prayer, if that makes sense. So that's why for the Maliki school, that if the imam is giving his khutbah, if he's walking to the mimbar, that you don't come into the masjid and pray your two prayers to greet the masjid or the two sunnah before Maghrib, I mean, before Juma. You just come in and you sit and you listen to the khutbah because you are in part of the prayer listening to the khutbah. Okay, so that's why uh, the Maliki school have, holds that opinion. Section on the conditions of the prayer. The conditions of the prayer are six. One, ritual purity from events that remove a state of purity or hadith. So a person has to have removed the hadith, either the lesser hadith which is removed through wudu, or the greater hadith, which is removed through ghusl. So what, that is the first condition of the prayer. The person has to be in a state of wudu, and he has to have completed a ghusl if he needs it. And if he can't do those that he has, have, he has to have done tayammum. And then purity from filth, the khabath, or the najasa from one's, uh, from one's body, clothes, clothes, or place of prayer. So removal of the khabath from those three things. From the body, anything that he's wearing, the clothes, anything, um, his body, anything that he's wearing, the clothes, or the place of prayer, and that's the place that he actually touches while he um, is praying. Also, one of the conditions of the prayer is covering one's nakedness, and he will define what is the nakedness for a man and what is the nakedness for a woman during prayer. Then facing the direction of the qibla, so... And this is going to differ, of course, if a person's in east of the east of the, the qibla, they're going to pray west. If they're west of the qibla, they're going to pray east. If they're south, they're going to pray north. If they're north, they're pray, going to pray south. If they're um, 
northwest of the Qibla, they're going to pray southeast. So they're just going to face the Qibla, depending on where they are. So the ulama have said that since facing the Qibla is an obligation, then also knowing the way to find the Qibla is also an obligation upon every single Muslim. So every single Muslim should have basic um, knowledge of, um, of the, the celestial um, signs to be able to find the Qibla. In the Quran it says, By the star they are guided, that they use the star to find the Qibla. So if you, for the people in the, um, in the, the, the strongest Qibla, the strongest proof for the Qibla, according to the Madahibs, to all, all the Madahibs, is the North Star. The North Star is a star um, that's, that's, um, that's part of the, um, uh, of the Little Dipper, and it does not move. All the other stars, if you watch them, they rise in the east and they set in the west, except for the North Star, it never moves. And depending on how far you are, if you're in more northern latitude, it's going to be higher in the sky, but it will never move from its position. And if you're in a southern latitude, it's going to be closer towards the horizon, but it will never move. So you know if you're facing it, that it will be north. So the ulama have said that if you're east of the Kaaba, that if you're east of the Kaaba, you put the, the north star to your right ear, and now you're facing the Kaaba. If you're west of the Kaaba, Put the North Star to your left side and you'll be facing it and so forth. So you use that once you know um, uh, where the North Star is, you know where North is and you know where, uh, uh, where you are in relation to the Kaaba and then you can find your way. The other, another proof that they said that is um, used for the people of the West is looking for Orion's belt. Orion is uh, one of the star signs um, that, they, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that rises in the East. And when it rises, you can look at where Orion's belt rises over the east, and you know that, that, that that's the direction of, of the Kaaba. The way you would find it using the sun is uh, you would uh, look for Matla al Atidal. Matla al Atidal is the normal, um, is, the, is the, the place where the sun rises during the spring and the fall equinox. During the spring, around March 15th, and during the um, during the fall, um, because in the winter time, in the summer sol in the winter solstice, the sun's going to be rising in the in the southern um, towards the south, and it's going to be a very short day. So you take that position, you you know where that is, and then you find out where the sun rises in the winter time, in the summertime, the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and then right in the middle is what is called the matla al atidad you'll be facing the direction of Qibla, and that's the direction where the sun will rise two times in the year during the spring equinox and during the fall equinox. Another way to find the directions would be during the middle of the day when the, sun, the shadow is, is at the Istiwa period, you know that it's pointing north, so you just align yourself um, to, to face in, um, in, the, in, the, in, in the west, you would face east, with varying degrees of south, depending on where you are, and then you would face the Qibla. وَتَرْكُ الْكَلَامِ وَتَرْكُ الْأَفْعَالِ الْكَثِيرَةِ Leaving speech, with the exception of the prayer's utterances, so another condition of the prayer is that you leave all speech, and then also avoiding excessive and unnecessary movements. تَرْكُ الْأَفْعَالِ الْكَثِيرَةِ And this is defined um, as if a, a, a doing so much um, movement that if a person were to look at you they would not think that you're in a state of prayer so if a person is just moving around unnecessarily if it's a little bit it's considered disliked but it does not invalidate the prayer if it becomes excessive then it would invalidate the prayer and again that definition would be that if a person were to look at them they would not think that they're in prayer the author mentioned the covering of the nakedness as being one of the conditions of the prayer now he mentions what exactly is the definition of the nakedness for the man and for the woman. The nakedness of a man is from just below the navel to just above his knees. This is the aura of the man that has to be covered during the prayer and as well as, well as outside of the prayer if there's other people around. When he says just, um, just below the navel, that means r right d d immediately below the navel, right where the navel star stops, um, that's where the, the nakedness begins. It's not an inch or a centimeter below the navel. It's right below uh, what is co uh, commonly called the belly button. So it would be right below that, 
would begin the nakedness and it goes to right above the knees and it's not an inch or a centimeter above the knees it's right where the knees begin that's the awrah so that has to be covered during the prayer as for the woman all of her body is nakedness with the exception of the face and the hands so during the prayer um, she has to cover everything but her face and her hands and this the same goes for if she's going to be upon uh, in the presence of non-related males other than her husband she would have to cover everything except for her face and her hands and she would even cover those if she fears that that um, that people would uh, that that by leaving those things uncovered it would attract attention of of men وَتُكْرَهُ الصَّلَاةُ فِي السَّرَاوِيلِ إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ فَوْقَهَا شَيْءٌ He says that it is reprehensible to pray in pants unless there is something over them. So for a man, it is reprehensible to pray in pants unless it's something fo- uh, over them. And what it means over them means in a, in a, linear, a linear direction uh, above them, and that means a shirt. So what he's saying here, the hukum, is that it's a makr- even though the, the, the aura, the nakedness that has to be covered for the validity of the prayer is what's between the navel and the knees, um, a person should w- wear a shirt to cover his chest, do something to cover his chest and his shoulders. So technically a man could pray bare-chested, but is it, it is extremely disliked. So he's saying here it is reprehensible to pray in pants unless there is something over them, meaning something above them, a shoulder cloth to put over the shoulders and cover the chest, or a shirt. So it's makruh for a man to pray bare-chested. Um, whereas praying in pants, if it's regular pants, it is not makru, as long as they're loose, if they're, if they're so tight to where they define the actual aura, they define the nakedness, then it's makru for um, a man or a woman to, to pray in them. Now for a man, it's makru t- for him to pray in them, and also if they're so tight to wear them in public, around people other than um, his, his spouse and for a woman if she goes out of her house in pants that are um, that are defining the the nakedness they're defining the aura her legs that would be haram so even if she wears pants that are baggy she has to wear some a shirt that would come down at least to her knees or something that would come down to um, to below her knees the best thing would be to wear uh, something that covers all the way down to her legs but if she, so she can't wear she can't wear merely pants to go out of the house even if they're loose but if she were to pray in them um, she should also she should cover she should put something over that and if she's going to go out of her house she should also go uh, cover that ومن تنجس ثوبه ولم يجد ثوبا غيره ولم يجد ما أن يغسله به أو لم يكن عنده ما يلبسه حتى يغسله وخاف خروج الوقت صلى بنجاسته. If anyone's clothes are soiled by impurity and he has no other garment, nor can he find water to purify it or another garment to wear while his is being washed, and he fears that the time of the prayer will pass, then he should pray with the soiled garment. So if a person has najasa on their clothes and they don't have water to clean them, or they don't have another pair of clothes, or if they do use water, or if they do try to find another pair of clothes, they're going to lose the the prayer time, then they go ahead and pray with that impurity on their body. So they wouldn't totally leave the prayer, and some people do this, they, they you ask them, why aren't you praying? And they'll say, oh, I have impurities on my body. So you have to tell them, well, you either have to remove those things, and if it's out of your uh, if it's out of your ability to remove them, then you go ahead and pray with those impurities. There's no condition where the prayer would um, uh, the obligation of the prayer would drop from you. And one of the scholars, um, one of the scholars said that the prayer would not um, the obligation of the prayer would not um, be removed even if a person was drowning. So even if a person was drowning, he would have to pray the prayer in the, in however he is able to in those last few minutes before he dies. So even in that state, a person would still have to pray. So if a person has, is, is not in that, uh, in that dire state, then he has, uh, he has no excuse to be leaving the prayer. وَلَا يَحِلُّ تَأْخِيرُ الصَّلَاةِ لِعَدْمِ الطَّهَارَةِ وَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ عَصَى رَبَّهُ it is not permissible to delay the prayer from its proper time due to lack of water. Indeed, anyone who does that has disobeyed his Lord. 
If someone cannot find what veils his nakedness, he should pray naked. So if a person is forced to become uh, to, 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 to be naked, for example, if they're in a prison and they're forced to be, uh, be naked, or they don't have anything to cover their nakedness with, then they go ahead and they pray naked. وَمَنْ أَخْطَأَ الْقِبْلَةَ أَعَادَ فِي الْوَقْتِ وَكُلُّ إِعَادَةٍ فِي الْوَقْتِ فَهِيَ فَضِيلَةٌ وَكُلُّ مَا تُعَادُ مِنْهُ الصَّلَاةُ فِي الْوَقْتِ فَلَا تُعَادُ مِنْهُ الْفَائِتَةُ وَالنَّافِلَةُ If someone makes a mistake, mistake regarding the direction of the qibla, he should repeat the prayer if time still remains. The repetition of the prayer in its time is a virtuous act. So, if somebody... Um, uh, um, tr uh, uh, tried to find out which direction was the Qibla and decided that the Qibla was in a certain direction, prayed and completed his prayer and did not realize that he w made a mistake in the Qibla until after the prayer, then his prayer is correct, but he should repeat the prayer if there's still time. If the time of that prayer has gone out, then there's no need to repeat it. وَكُلُّ مَا تُعَادُ مِنْهُ الصَّلَاةُ فِي الْوَقْتِ فَلَا تُعَادُ مِنْهُ الْفَائِتَةُ وَالنَّافِلَةُ so the repetition of his prayer after, um, if there's still time and after he has completed his prayer would be considered a fadila. So where it says he should repeat his prayer, it means that it's recommended for him to repeat his prayer. And every time, every prayer that's repeated in its time, he should then, um, he would not repeat a prayer whose time has gone out or a nafila prayer. So wherever it says in this text or another text that he should repeat the prayer if there's still time, then a person would know that that repetition is not an obligation, rather it is rec only recommended. And also, once the prayer time has gone out, then it's no longer recommended for him to repeat that prayer. And also, a person would not repeat a nafila prayer. If he had prayed a, um, a nafila prayer and made a mistake in the qibla and then realized it afterwards, then he would not repeat it even if there was, um, uh, he would not repeat it. The prayer that we're talking about that he would repeat is an obligatory prayer that he realized a mistake after he had prayed. Okay, and we're going to stop for the, the mutasada akhtari uh, there. And I, what I want to stress from this uh, uh, series, right, is the importance of the prayer, of not missing the prayer time. Like you said, even if, if, if you have no way of covering your nakedness, you have to pray during that time. If you have, if you have no way of removing the filth from your body, you have to pray during that time. You know, uh, there's no condition in which you can delay the prayer for any reason, right? And I'm, I'm counseling myself on that first and foremost, right? Uh, and then if you, if you have made a mistake in your prayer and you find that you've made a mistake in that prayer, there is an ability or, or, or time and or there is time to, to repeat that prayer that you should repeat that prayer, okay? Um, and so that's, that's one of the first uh, points that we were talking about. So just to cover what the, the main points that we talked about today were the six conditions of the prayer. So the first is uh, purity from hadith. So making wudu, making ghusl, making uh, um, tayammum if needed, right? So a state of purity, right? Uh, purity of kabath, impurities on one clothes or place of prayer, right? That's why we use prayer rugs, uh, making sure that there's no uh, impurities on your body covering your nakedness. And they went over what the aura is for the man from just below the belly button to just above the knee uh, and the aura of the woman, the entire body, uh, except for her face and her hands. Uh, and then we go on to the Qibla, facing the Qibla, knowing where the, where the Kaaba is and, and putting yourself in the proper position. Number five, leaving speech. It's impermissible for you to talk during the prayer. This is why we're told like during Juma, right? That talking during Juma alleviates the blessing of Juma. It removes the blessing of Juma because a condition of the prayer is leaving speech. And as we mentioned before, 
when the imam is giving the khutbah, you are actually in a state of ibadah. So talking during that time removes the prayer for you, okay? Um, and then the final and the, the, the final condition of the prayer is leaving excessive movements, okay? Um, and, you know, it, it's, it can be either subtle movements, you know, but that which is unnecessary. I was in a class one time and, they, and, and a, a student asked a question, what happens if, you know, uh, your baby rolls over and he says that, you know, and, and you, you have to get to your baby, right? That's not excessive because you're protecting your child. So he said in that, in that case, you can actually go and grab your child and then enter back into the prayer and it's valid because that's not excessive movement. Right, that's necessary movement. But if you're in the prayer and you're just, you know, scratching your head and, you know, scratching your arm and, you know, yeah, on your phone, you know, even during the the the, the juma, right? These are excessive behaviors, right? And if you've done that, then your prayer becomes invalid. Okay, so these are points that we. Uh, should know about and that we should that we should actually take action on as soon as possible okay um so we're just going to real quick um we're going to go to the uh, a little bit about the prophet muhammad sallam, his sirah uh, i took a little bit longer in that section because i wanted to touch on and finish the section of the the conditions of the prayer um so give me one second as we pull up the sirah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, the sirah is the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So sirah, uh, it comes from a term uh, where it says, it means like, as that person goes, right? As that person is. So that's what the sirah is. It's learning about how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, okay? Um, so let's begin. Okay, a bird comes and takes the snake off. All right, we went back a little bit. It was uh, Nusaybin and they were from there. And before that, there was a place called Abqa in Yemen in Hadramaut, which was their land. And Aisha anha, asked the Prophet once about Khurafat. Khurafat are superstitious stories. So where we are in the theater of the Prophet Muhammad, what he's talking about right now in the Sira is the time where the the jinn, right, uh, as the Prophet Muhammad is going back to Medina after uh, some some the 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 time in Taif. He's going back to Medina and in the desert. And as he's returning, he's reciting Quran. And Jen came to him and said that they they hear what he's reciting and they believe in him. Okay, so the Prophet Muhammad is beginning to get. Uh, believers from both man and jinn, okay? Um, so for those that may not know, the jinn are a creation of Allah um, that they are made out of a, a smokeless fire. Let's see, the angels are made out of life, men are made out of clay, and the jinn are made out of a smokeless fire. This is, but they're a creation of Allah. Um, and they do interact with mankind, right? In both positive and negative ways, okay? Um, so this is, in this time, so what, what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is talking about right now um, is stories that have been related in the past of how people have interacted with the jinn. And what he's about to tell is a story that Aisha the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, told about a person that interacted with the jinn. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Khurafa was an Arab man 
who was actually kidnapped by the jinn and taken to this place called Abqab. Now, I don't know about alien abductions and things like that, you know, but uh, nowadays they talk about that. Allahu alam, you know, I, I really don't know. I don't, I haven't really read it. I'm not that interested in it. But, uh, you know, the jinn do, can abduct uh, both. And they abducted this poor man, Khurafa, and took him to Abqar. And he saw the most bizarre thing. He went back and he started telling people and they started saying, how the hadith of Khurafa. This is like a Khurafa story. So it became the word for crazy stories, Khurafat. And Abqari is a genius. Now, a genius is also, the, uh, the Latin word for it is from a Greek word, which is from the same Arabic word, jinn. So a genius is, it's the same meaning, an abqari, somebody who they're like, they, they believe that geniuses had a jinn on their shoulder telling them all this stuff because they were so different from other people, right? Okay, so jinn, and, and for people that might be, you know, they're, they're used to American culture and, you know, um, that we do have stories of jinn in our culture, right? But what do we call them? We call them genies, okay? We call them genies. So the jinn is not a, a foreign idea to our culture, whether people want to accept it or not, right? Um, but in, of course, in ancient cultures, the idea of genies were more prevalent or jinn were more prevalent, or but, or, but of those that are able to, to dabble in, you know, uh, what we would consider unnatural, um elements right but the the jinn are a reality they're spoken about in the quran and they are a real creation of allah and they have free will so some jinn are believers in allah and his messenger but also some jinn are not some jinn are disbelievers in fact uh there was a famous uh uh Sufi philosopher, Ibn Sab'in, some people say he was a heretic, but uh, one of the scholars, I think it was it is Ibn Abdul Salam, one of the scholars said that he spent uh, from the early morning until Dhuhr with him, and he said he could understand the individual words he said, but when he put them together, he couldn't understand them. He, he, he was just so uh, in another realm. His, his language was just so complicated. Right. Now, Imam al-Baqalani, <laughs> he used to give these long answers. He had a lot of public debates, and he used to give these long answers. They were very complicated. He was absolute genius. And his, the people in the debate, they, they'd like, you know, they, and once he gave an incredibly uh, brilliant answer that was very long, and he said, you know, if my opponent can repeat what I just said, I'll, I'll surrender the debate to him. And his opponent said, Imam al Bakr, if you can repeat what you just said, I'll <laughs> surrender the debate to you. <laughs> so anyway, these jinn heard the revelation, and uh, that's where Surat al-Jinn comes, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing was Nafar, which is usually less than 10, some say it was 7 yin that heard uh, the messenger uh, of Allah and they believed in him. And also, uh, when Surah Al-Rahman came down, he said it to the jinn. And whenever they said, because it was to the ins and the jinn, which of the favors of the Lord do you two deny, jinn and ins? And the jinn would say, we don't deny any of them. And when he recited it to uh, the Muslim, the human Muslims, uh, they, they didn't respond. And he said, your brothers from the jinn had a better response uh, than you did. So, uh, and there's also a masjid in Mecca called Masjid al-Jinn, uh, which is where this, event occurred. Uh, it's not far from uh, the Haram Sharif. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ, obviously he can't return he, uh, under the same conditions which caused him to leave for Ta'if because he's really being abused now. And uh, he, he asked uh, Akhnas ibn Sharif for a uh, 
protection and he wouldn't give it to him. But Mut'im, again, Ibn Adi, uh, gives him protection. And Mut'im, if you remember, was one of the people that was vehemently against uh, the, uh, the sanctions against Bani Hashim. So he agrees to him and he goes to the Kaaba with him. And Abu Jahl, the first thing they said, are you Tabi' or uh, Mujir? Are you follower or are you a protector? In other words, if you've become a follower, it's amazing jahiliyyah here. He said, if you become a Muslim, we're not interested in your protection. So are you a follower or a protector? And he said, I'm Mujir, I'm a protector. And they said, then we'll honor your protection because he wasn't a Muslim. Now, uh, here comes... Okay, so we're going to stop right there for the day because this is very important, right? Before we get to the Isra and the Miraj. So what happened is, is that um, the Prophet Muhammad says, and actually I think next week I'm going to back it up a little bit because I want to really talk about the dua that the Prophet Muhammad made to the to Allah after the 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 the, the day of, of Qa'id, right? Which he said is one of his worst days. Um, but at, he left Mecca because the Muslims and him were being oppressed. Okay. He came back to Mecca. Um, he was trying to come back, but he couldn't go back into Mecca in the same condition in which he left being oppressed. Right. So Mutam Ibn Adi, and it's very important because we, we talked about the tribes, Ibn Adi. So it's like Omar Omar ibn al Khattab ibn Adi. Omar is a is a a, a, a Adam, which means and and the the they were judges. They were people that stood up for the Meccan tradition. One of the reasons why Omar had had set before his Islam had set to kill the Prophet Muhammad Islam is because he did not like that the Prophet Muhammad Islam. Was, was violating the traditions of the Meccans, okay? So he was, he was a traditionalist. He believed in the Meccan structure. So Mutam ibn Adi is, of the, is an Adawi as well. So he also believing in the Meccan structure, being a man of, of justice, goes to the Kaaba and announces that I, Mutam ibn Adi, gives Muhammad ibn Abdullah protection, okay? Under the Jahili structure of protection. Now, if someone is to hurt him, okay, they have to deal with all of the clan of Adi because now the clan's protection is under question, okay? So we have to understand how this jahili structure works out. So now the Prophet Muhammad is able to enter back into Mecca under protection of Mutam, Mutam and the, the Adawi clan. Okay. So understanding, you know, the, of course, this is early on. Um, well, not, not really early on. This is probably about the 10th or 11th year after the message has been um, has been delivered to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, um, so that's where we're going. Like I said, next week, inshallah, I'm going to back it up a little bit um, and we're going to discuss the dua that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made because it's very important and it's a very beautiful dua. All right, so thank you guys for coming. Um, and inshallah, we will begin again Monday at eight o'clock with the uh, the creed of Imam at tahawi and purification of the heart. Okay, so if you guys like what you heard, I, I really appreciate it. You can comment, uh, you can subscribe to the channel because I'm going to post this on Facebook. Uh, and inshallah we can continue to get some followings and get through this information. So thank you guys for coming. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ashadu wa la ilaha Allah. Ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. Wa asr inna insana nafi khusil al-adhina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasal biha. Wa tawasal bis sabr. Assalamu alaikum.